number uh, 24, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, welcome and uh, good afternoon to uh, everybody here. Uh, first of all, let's welcome our guest of honor uh, today, uh, His Excellency uh, Peter uh, Blumeyer, the ambassador of the, uh, uh, the of Germany to Malaysia. We welcome him to our uh, lecture today. I would like to welcome all our viewers who are uh, in the Zoom and the YouTube channel uh, of the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization, IIUM. Uh, welcome all of you to the uh, Istak World Professorial number uh, 24. Uh, brothers and sisters, we are very much honored to have His Excellency here. And also we are very much uh, delighted to see that in the last two years, uh, today we are having the 24th professorial lecture. And as you all remember, this lecture uh, participated by great scholars, uh, dignitaries, philosophers, experts. And if you remember, one of the lectures was presented by the late uh, His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Japan, who uh, passed away, Shinzo uh, Abe, one of the speakers. And also, as you all remember, this Stack World Professorial Lecture is not only meant for academic professors and uh, scholars, but it's open to uh, bridge the academia and the industry, and also to bridge the academia and the diplomatic uh, uh, life and work and expert and scholars, and to bring together the academicians, the scholars, the philosophers, the diplomats, the ambassadors, the NGO and civil society leaders and scholars. That's the beauty of our Stack World Professorial Lecture, so that we see the different perspectives of the issues and the problems and the challenges that we address under uh, our institute, uh, brothers and sisters here. This is why the invitation of His Excellency, uh, Dr. Peter uh, Borlemeyer is, is something great to us. Um, I, I, I just wanted to remind you that uh, one of the ambassadors who presented the Stack World the Professorial Richard is His Excellency uh, uh, Grégoire, the ambassador of Belgium to Malaysia a year ago or so, brothers and sisters. Let's, before we uh, call upon His Excellency to deliver uh, his lecture today, uh, remember, give you some account uh, of His Excellency's uh, background, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, His Excellency Ambassador uh, Peter, uh, he has worked in uh, many capacities, uh, plus being a, a person who holds a PhD in history and master degree in history. He also worked in these areas of uh, diplomacy. Uh, to mention uh, uh, some of uh, the credentials of His uh, Excellency, brothers and sisters, we uh, mention here that His Excellency was, he is currently the ambassador uh, of Germany to Malaysia. He worked also as the Council General to Serbia and Far East in uh, Russian Federation before. He also served as head of task force, uh, return management foreign office in Berlin. He worked as ambassador of, the, of Germany to the Republic of Uganda, as ambassador to the Republic of Kosovo, as ambassador to the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, he worked also as head of the Division for Immigration, Asylum and Visa Law Foreign Office in Berlin. He also worked as Deputy Ambassador to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. 
He served also as deputy head of division for EU enlargement foreign office in Berlin. He worked also as a deputy ambassador to the Republic of Albania. He worked also uh, in the desk as a desk officer in the division for general personal and organizational issues, foreign ministry uh, in uh, Bonn, and also in the um, office in the economic department of the German embassy to the kingdom of Japan. Brothers and sisters, our scholars and participant today, he also worked in the uh, economy, he worked also in the division for general order, security council, general assembly, and peacekeeping mission of the UN, the uh, foreign office uh, in Bonn, and there are many other uh, uh, um, activities that he has done. When it comes to his academic credentials, as I mentioned earlier, he has uh, a master degree uh, for from Albert Liedwigs University in Germany, and also a PhD in history. His topic in the, uh, his PhD in history, uh, the state of emergency in the last years of Weimar, the significance of law, doctrine and practice of the power of emergency for the decline of the Republic of Weimar and the takeover by the National Socialists, a study on the relation of power and law, brothers and sisters. Uh, today, His Excellency uh, Dr. Peter will be addressing us on a topic of his choice, which is rule of law or might makes right the current state of international relations in our world, brothers and sisters. Without any delay, I call upon His Excellency Dr. Peter to start his lecture. Go ahead, Your Excellency. Uh, excellencies, dear colleagues from the Diplomatic Corps, uh, professors um, and scholars, uh, students, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank you, um, Professor, for inviting me now apparently on a weekly basis and then uh, giving, giving uh, uh, such kind words of introduction uh, uh, for me. Um, I would like to thank all of you uh, for your time coming here. Um, and for your interest into this uh, lecture, which admit, admittedly is a difficult and challenging topic. Our subject uh, today um, is the relation between might and right, power and law, and current international relations. Uh, however, we cannot approach our subject without looking back, without regarding the backdrop against which our international system has um, evolved. So please allow me to take you on a little historic journey. Um, our lecture is thus um, divided into three parts. Uh, we start with um, regarding the features of the international order um, as it has emerged in uh, the early modern age in Europe, prevailing thereafter for about 300 years. We then take a look at the system of the United Nations, um, which was established by its charter in uh, 1945, uh, also including some new elements emerging thereafter. And finally, we see how the international system is functional, or maybe not functioning uh, today. So we start uh, with the system emerging after the Westphalian peace of uh, 1648. The two agreements of Münster and Osnabrück, two cities in Western Germany of 1648, known as the Westphalian peace, brought peace to Germany and a number of other European states after the Thirty Years' War. This war started out 
as a religious war between Catholics and Protestants and turned into a territorial war between the Holy Roman Empire of German nation. This was the name of Germany at that time, various German states and later France and Sweden. Actually, it was a number of consecutive and parallel wars with different and changing alliances, which in the eyes of the contemporaries blurred into one long age of war. It was the biggest catastrophe in German history so far on German territory, costing the lives of about one third of the population. And it ended only because the, of the exhaustion of each and every participant. The system established after this war was an answer to this age of religious wars, as well as to the strife for hegemony in Europe. It comprised as major elements, sovereignty, territoriality, and equal status of all states. They became the fundamental elements of the international order for almost 300 years. So let's have a look at these three elements, starting with territoriality. In the Middle Ages, not territoriality, but personality determined loyalties. That was not only in the, in the Middle Ages um, of Europe, but also in many other parts uh, of the world, including uh, what we call today Malaysia and uh, at that time Sumatra. Vessels followed a ruler, irrespective of territories, and the ruled, ruler's power depended on the power of his follow, followers, his uh, vessels. This now changed in the early modern age when modern states emerged. States were bound to a certain territory, which stood with its people under the rule of a monarch or a prince or a republic. This was the foundation of the modern state characterized by territory, people, authority. So this is the uh, territorial principle. Now we uh, move on to sovereignty. Sovereignty has an internal and an external dimension. We stop for a longer time now at the internal dimension of uh, sovereignty. It, uh, internally, it means the supreme and ultimate authority of a person or an institution, such as state. An absolute monarchy, the king or emperor is sovereign. In a fascist state, the leader, or in German nationalism at that time, we said Führer is sovereign. In a military dictatorship, it is the ruling junta. In a one-party system like a communist state, the party, respectively the Politburo, respectively the general secretary of the Politburo, is sovereign. In a theocracy, it is the highest priest. But now, democracy. That's more difficult. How, uh, who is the sovereign uh, in a democracy? It is not a person or a group of persons, but it is the rule of law. The law establishes a separation of powers, which does not assign sovereignty to one person or to one branch of powers. Otherwise, separation of powers would be overruled and the essence of the rule of law would be lost. Thus, each act of a state authority is and has to be authorized by law. The essential condition of the functioning of this system is that the law is respected. If not by everyone, then at least by a critical mass of Democrats taming anti-democratic forces who have appetite for more power than the constitution assigns to them. A democracy cannot survive without Democrats. Historically, the concept of sovereignty preceded the rule of law. The big name here is next to Jean Baudin in France, Thomas Hobbes, who shaped our understanding of sovereignty. Until today, however, his doctrine of sovereignty um, uh, be, um, uh, remains problematic. Hobbes believed that at the end of the day, you need one person who determines what will be done. One person embodying sovereignty who had to be in his eyes, the monarch. This absolute power 
would make him the Leviathan, as he called it, the cosmic monster. Everybody would have to abide him. And the logic behind this is security. Only an absolute monarch has the power to guarantee security to his subject, to everyone. Without this, we would live forever in a state of nature, which is not a blessed paradise, but which is hell on earth, an eternal war of one against the other. He called that homo hominis lupus. This is Latin for meaning um, a wolf is a, a man's wolf. To overcome the state of nature, everybody, according to Hobbes, was well advised to turn over the little power he had as an individual into the hands of the absolute monarch who would in turn guarantee security for all his subjects. This is the initial social contract between the monarch and his subjects. And there is no way out of this antagonism, eternal war or surrender to the absolute power. Fortunately, English state philosophy had to offer another order with a less grim idea of the nature of man. That was John Locke. He assigned certain unalienable rights to every human derived by the law of nature, which actually is a natural law of reason, reason being a feature of humans who are blessed with this by nature. They use the reason to perceive God's law, and this law is assigning to humans natural rights, being valid without need of approval of a Leviathan, like Hobbes thought. Freedom, equality, physical inviolability, protection of individual property. For Locke, this always remains valid in the social contract, and everybody, each and every citizen, has the right to resistance if these rights are touched. It was also Locke who first presented first ideas of separation of power later established as a political theory by the French philosopher Montesquieu. So the essence of the internal sovereignty is uh, the ability of states to guarantee the absence of violence. Because if conflicts within a state are um, solved violently, then you are in a state of war, civil war. This ability of a state to preserve a minimum of peace might be based on the sheer power of a person, like a dictator, or of a certain privileged group. People are then afraid to rebel, to protest against this power because they fear disadvantages. However, this ability to maintain peace might also be based on the authority of a state. People accept the internal power, not for fear, but um, because uh, they accept the way decisions come about, even if a decision is not favoring them because they believe in law. This is or should be the case in a functioning democracy practicing the rule of law. Here we observe an obedience of people to state institutions about applying the law. This is an obedience based on conviction not an obedience to a person or group based on fear, as we often find it in dictatorships. So this was the internal part of uh, sovereignty. We come now to the external part. Externally, sovereignty was understood as the independence of states from other states. This included the freedom from interference by other states in their internal affairs. States, as subjects of inter, inter, uh, international law were impermeable. That's what it was called, impermeable. Whatever happened inside them was none of the business of other states. And this was the famous principle of non-interference. Furthermore, um, the ability of a state to determine its external affairs belonged to sovereignty. The state as a subject of sovereignty could interact with other states. This ability was considered factual, not legal. If a state could maintain order within its own boundaries and was accepted by the other states as a subject of sovereignty, it was sovereign. Thus, 
sovereignty was meant to be a factual quality. Now the third one, equality. In the new international order, emerging after the Westphalian peace, all states were supposed to have an equal status. This was the end of the idea of a pre-stabilized unity of a Christian Occident under the God-given dual supremacy of the emperor, that was the head of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, and the Pope. It was the dawn of a secularized age of equal states, the relations of which were based on international law. But one feature of this international law was the right to war. Thus, the new Westphalian international order put an end to religious wars, but it also was the starting point of endless new wars. Of the subjects of this international order, the states, fighting for new, uh, new territories, fighting for, so um, for, for hegemony, or fighting for their mere existence. Meanwhile, technique of warfare and of weaponry ever advanced, causing also more victims in, in wars. This eventually cumulated in the horrors of the First and Second World Wars uh, in the first half of the 20th century, causing approximately 17 million dead in the First World War and 70, 70 million deaths in the Second World War. And then the need for a new international order was irrefutable. Let's remember this international order of Westphalia included the rights of the states to war. The war was an accepted means in the international system. Belong to the sovereign rights of states. Now um, we turn to the system the United Nations de uh, developed, um, the UN Charter, and also the development of the international law after 1945. The Arab language has a beautiful greeting by which we greeted our, uh, when, when I arrived, when we arrived, assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. What does it mean, peace? Peace is firstly a state of mind, reflecting that a person is in harmony with himself. That is an important quality to maintain peace with others. Because secondly, peace is a status of relations between persons, between groups, and between states. It is not necessarily the absence of conflicting interests or even tensions, but it is as a minimum, the absence of the use of violence in conflicts. To maintain peace or safeguard at least a state of nonviolence was the intention of the founders of the very short-lived League of Nations after World War I, which was established after World War I, and little later, in 1928, 11 states, including my country, Germany, um, subscribed to the renunciation of violence in the Brion Kellogg Pact of 1928, very important date in international uh, history. By 1939, nine, it was already 60 states who have sub subscribed uh, to this principle. However, we know that this failed because in 1939, uh, World War II broke out. After the horrors of World War II, the craving for peace was even greater and was the driving force for the establishment of the United Nations. Um, the Charter of the United Nations starts out with a general prohibition of violence. I quote, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. And the members of um, the United Nations made the Security Council of this institution to their Leviathan, to their highest uh, instance. I quote again, in order to ensure prompt and effective action by the United Nations, its members confer on the Security Council primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security and agree that in carrying out its duties under this responsibility, 
the Security Council acts on their behalf. The members of the United Nations agree to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the present charter. So the Security Council of the United Nations is charged with upholding world peace. It is empowered to determine any threat to or breach of peace and to take the measures, may they involve the use of force or not, to maintain or restore peace. There are some noticeable exception to this prince, uh, uh, general prohibition of violence. Besides the right of the Security Council to take forceful measures in case of breach of peace, another undisputed exception is the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense uh, self in case of an armed attack also acknowledged in the Charter of the United Nations. If you are attacked, you are allowed to defend yourself. Very contentious, though, is an exception for humanitarian intervention, whilst the concept of the responsibility to protect has won wide support within the community of states. So we have two, ex two other exceptions, the humanitarian uh, intervention, which is not generally accepted, and the responsibility to protect, and we turn to them now. Both of them have in common that they affect the traditional interpretation of sovereignty based on impermeability of the states and the principle of non-intervention also laid down in the Charter of the United Nations. Sovereignty is now understood not only as a characteristic or a right of states, but also as an obligation as responsibility to safeguard the security of citizens. This, of course, brings up immediately the question of who decides if states do not live up to this responsibility? Who shall decide this? The traditional interpretation of sovereignty avoids this question by already denying its legitimacy, clinging onto the impermeability of states. The concepts of humanitarian intervention and of the responsibility to protect provide different answers to this question. The humanitarian intervention involves the use of armed forces on the territory of another state in order to prevent or stop massive human rights violations in that state. The question who decides is simply answered. It entirely depends on the sovereign decision of the intervening state or group of states. This, however, seems to turn upside down the international order established by the Charter of the United Nations, which confers the power to intervene exclusively to the UN Security Council. However, champions of the humanitarian interventions point out that this international order, which we have, is dysfunctional because the Security Council all too often is incapable to act and one cannot stand by watching atrocities ongoing without bring, bringing help to the victims. So we do have a dilemma here, which we have to admit. The dilemma is that the protection of human rights could be a noble cause for such an intervention, but the intervention could as well be just a pretext for a prohibited war of aggression. That's the dilemma in which we have there. Supporters of the uh, um, concept of the responsibility to protect do not go as far as the champions um, of humanitarian invention. The legally not binding but relevant resolution of the UN General Assembly dating back to 2005 states, <clears throat> I quote, each individual state has the responsibility to protect its populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. This responsibility entails the prevention of such crimes, including their incitement through appropriate and necessary means. We accept that responsibility and we will act in accordance with it. And another quote, we are prepared to take collective action in a timely and decisive manner through the Security Council, 
in accordance with the charter, including chapter seven, where the right of the Security Council to take also forceful actions uh, is stipulated on a case by case basis and in cooperation with relevant regional organizations as appropriate, should peaceful means be inadequate and national authorities manifestly fail to protect their populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. That is the famous. R2P, the responsibility to protect resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations. This R2P resolution constrains interventions by limiting it to only four cases, genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. And by leaving the ultimate right to intervene with the UN Security Council. So also this R2P resolution has a problem because it cannot escape the dilemma of what to do in a case where the Security Council is not capable of deciding, if it is not able to act. So this is uh, where we stand uh, right now in the international system. And uh, we, we have now a look at the practice. How does it function in our age? Um, how can it cope with these challenges pointed out? And my impression, my thesis, which I present to you is that we are still oscillating between the Westphalian system with the right to war and the UN system. If we look at article two of the UN charter, we see it stipulates the principle of the sovereign equality of all its members. That was the same with the Westphalian system. Also the Westphalian system was based on the equality of states, but different from uh, the United Nations system, this was only in theory, because in reality, uh, the acceptance of a sovereign right to war exposed the smaller states to the appetite of the bigger states. Smaller states had to turn to bigger states for protection or just vanish. And we have many examples for that in Germany. Many German states vanished just in that time. The international system was not ruled by law, but a, by a very precarious balance of powers. That is the famous balance of powers, but powers easily got out of this balance and slided into war. So that was uh, the Westphalian system. Is it different now? Did the UN system bring a change? Today, we have two approaches. One is a descriptive approach and one is a normative approach to deal with what we call the world order. The descriptive approach corresponds more to the Westphalian order, the normative one to the order of the United Nations established. However, and this makes it a bit more complicated, the descriptive approach also relies on normative arguments to consolidate its power basis. And the normative approach depends on real power to prevail against the descriptive approach. This is very abstract and I'm now concretizing it and, and hope to make it clear. The descriptive approach regards relations between states as a continuous power play and the international law only as a tool which you apply when it is useful to you and which you, you twist or even abandon if it does not serve your interests. Famous double standards. In this view, states do not, not enjoy equality, but great powers have zones of influence where they can dominate the affairs at their will. They might maintain that this is not how it should be, but they say that's how it is. They advise to accept this reality. And advocates of this approach, and you all of them, uh, you, you know, you know, uh, you all know, uh, know them, advocates of this approach believe that their opponents are naive or insincere. And, but their opponents, who have the other approach, they complain that this reason, reasoning is effectively giving up on the implementation of law. You abandon law with this view. So what do they say? The other, the normative approach believes in the rule of law being the one and only point of reference for the relations between states. The view insists on the equality of all states 
and rejects the right of the stronger as a fatalist position. It also rejects its position to be criticized as naive, idealistic, or insincere. It is very well aware of the necessity that it needs a power base to implement international law. It takes a sufficient number of states defending the rule of law. Then even greater powers need to take this into account. However, prerequisite for a functioning is that these states stand up for their conviction, for the rule of law. And you will notice something. This is a parallel to a democracy, which, as we saw, can only function if there is a critical mass of Democrats supporting the Constitution and the rule of law, whilst containing undemocratic forces. In democracy, we find no sovereign taking last and uncontrolled decisions. Even a president with far-reaching power is bound by law. There is no sovereign power to um, enforce international law. And that, that's uh, the, in the international system, we, we have the, a comparable situation to a democracy. We don't, we don't have a sovereign who can implement uh, international law. The Security Council was meant to be that, but it's, it's dysfunctional. The UN Charter foresees it, but um, the Security Council has not assumed his function and a perpetual strife has stalemated this institution. Thus, there is only the community of states who could guarantee the application of the international law. This, again, depends on a critical mass of law-abiding states who additionally have the physical means to make others, less law-abiding states, stick to the rules. There is no international law without a sufficient number of strong and law-abiding states, as there is no democracy without Democrats. The war of aggression Russia is leading against Ukraine nowadays offers an excellent example for the descriptive approach, which is not guided by law, but only randomly exploiting law for other purposes. I must say I first hesitated to bring this example here, um, facing this distinguished audience here in Malaysia, because I did not want to expose myself as being Eurocentric. Why do I bring an example from Europe? There are other conflicts in this world. We all know them in Myanmar, in Yemen, in Ethiopia, you name it. And, and they also equally de deserve our attention. I know this. Um, it's, lastly, it's always about humans, suffering humans, where, where we are talking about. But for our topic, the Russian war against Ukraine is most telling because Russia being a permanent member of the uh, United Nations Security Council, this war is challenging our international system, international law at large. And the other conflicts uh, do not have this quality. Russia, so let's, let's take this as an example for what I just explained before. Um, Russia has brought up different justifications for its behavior using them as a tool for mitigating the effects of its aggression on other nations. One justification is that it had to protect the Russian-speaking population in Ukraine against a Ukrainian neo-Nazi government. This claim is trying to disguise its aggression as a humanitarian intervention. However, apart from never proving its accusation against the Ukrainian government, an intervention causing casualties and injuries of hundreds of thousands of soldiers and ten thousands of civilians, including many children, not to speak of millions of refugees and tens of thousands of abducted, uh, abducted children. You cannot call that a humanitarian intervention. It turns, turns things completely upside down. It is the opposite, and the claim is a blatant abuse of the instrument irrespective of the fact that there are also other interventions, calling themselves humanitarian interventions, which have also failed to serve the humanitarian cause. Another excuse Russia forwarded for its aggression is that it felt threatened by NATO extension to Ukraine. This is the classical claim of a zone of influence. Russia claims the right to decide whether its neighbors 
may exceed an alliance with other states or not, justifying it with its own security needs, whilst obviously ignoring the security needs of its neighbors. This, of course, is endless, because once Russia's zone of influence is accepted, it will need to extend this zone of influence also onto other neighbors. New neighbors is as found then. And I can tell you neighbors like Poland and the Baltic states, who had bad experiences with Russia in history, they are fearing exactly that scenario, even when they are in NATO now. And actually, that is the reason why all these states seek to slip under the security umbrella of NATO. Also, Russia's security argument is, was unfounded from the beginning because the accession of Ukraine to NATO was not even discussed when Russia started its war. And the security argument has been refuted by reality because now we have this war ongoing and NATO has not intervened militarily against Russia, though an intervention would have been conform with the UN Charter covered by the right to collective self-defense. Ukraine could call NATO for help, and uh, NATO would be uh, legitimized uh, to help. But it, uh, NATO refrains from making use of this right, taking the utmost care to prevent an all-out war against Russia. So what we just have to observe is that Russia is leading a war of aggression prohibited by the Charter of the United Nations. The intention behind this even goes beyond a claim of zone of influence or the establishment of a hegemony. The intention openly declared by Putin is to extinct another state, Ukraine, and incorporate its territory into its own. Russian, under Putin's leadership, has mentally fallen back into the Westphalian order. And Russia is posing a deadly threat to the United Nations system as it is not an ordinary state, but a permanent member of the Security Council with a veto power, charged with maintaining peace on this planet. The United Nations system cannot take any measures against its worst enemy, Russia, because this enemy is an essential part of the system. At least there was an unequivocal condemnation of Russia's war by not less than 141 member states of the uh, UN General Assembly, including my Malaysia, by the way, but this has no practical consequences. So this um, is the state which we uh, have now in, uh, uh, at this moment, and um, confronted with this failure of the UN system, what choice do other states have? Those who are not so powerful, should they accept reality and try to soothe powerful states by accepting their claims of zones of influence? Should they somehow try to balance out powerful states? Should they seek alliances to protect themselves? Or should they dare insisting on the rule of law, of international law? Different states are in different positions and have a different behavior. But in the long run, they will not be able to avoid a decision on what is right and what is wrong. And only the strengthening of the rule of law can guarantee security to them. All the other options will not lead to a, a, a permanent security. We need a critical mass of states standing up for the rule of law, ostracizing states, even bigger states, for disregarding the law, supporting victims of transgression of law, and then we can make a difference and we can lead us out of this endless circle of violence to which the world is exposed if we continue allowing powerful states to impose their will on others arbitrarily. Russia has grossly abused the idea of humanitarian intervention for justifying a war of aggression. Other nations too have pursued selfish goals in humanitarian missions. Does this discredit humanitarian interventions and protective measures in general? I think not. At least we should not fall behind the minimum consensus expressed in the R2P resolution of the United Nations General Assembly. But this, however, 
demands a functioning UN Secre uh, Security Council, which we are lacking since long. The only instrument uh, we have right now is the humanitarian intervention. That is to say, uh, states taking the decision to um, intervene for humanitarian reasons. It will not help people who face genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, or crimes against humanity, if we tell them, sorry, at the moment, the Security Council is out of order and we cannot help you. We cannot do anything. People who are in such a situation, they need help. I say this with inner conviction because um, as a young diplomat, I was stationed in Albania, in, in the Balkans. And um, we had a situation in 1998 there um, uh, where um, the Serbian government was persecuting uh, the Albanian uh, population in Kosovo. It was a, a majority of Albanians living there um, and it belonged to Serbia, but it was a majority of Albanians living there, a Muslim population. And as early as 1998, that was one year before the NATO intervention, um, uh, the, the people, 10,000s of people already crossed the border to Albania um, and um, uh, they, they were just fleeing, yeah? they were persecuted. And uh, I, uh, I could stand at the border and I saw their villages uh, being burned. And, and these people came then to, to, uh, to Albania to, um, to look um, uh, for refuge. And uh, at that time, um, the, um, uh, the Western powers tried to um, get uh, permission from the Security Council to intervene, to help these people. But Russia put in his veto, one time again, Russia. And uh, then um, the Western states decided a humanitarian invention on behalf of these people. And uh, also Germany participated in it, at this. And it was for the first time since the Second World War that uh, Germany went to war again. And um, this was, of course, very much uh, debated um, in Germany. And we had a foreign minister, uh, Joschka Fischer, and um, he was in favor of the intervention and he brought a very strong argument. He told his fellow German citizens the lesson from these dark years of national socialism in Germany. The lesson is not only never go to war again, it is also never allow Auschwitz to happen again, never allow genocide to happen again. And here we are facing ethnic cleansing, very obviously, because the Serbs wanted to push out the Albanian Muslim population. Um, and uh, this could have amounted uh, to as much as, um, uh, as a genocide. So for me, um, the intervention in Kosovo is an exam the example of su a successful humanitarian in uh, intervention. Didn't last very long, uh, three months, and then, then everything was over and, um, uh, and the United Nations mission uh, was, was established there. I have to admit though, that um, in general, we do not have a good balance of um, interventions. Unfortunately, many of them failed. Um, Afghanistan is a sad example. It's now back in the hands of the Taliban, um, and they are clamping down on women's rights again. Uh, they are turning the wheel back um, after 20 years of development. And, and you have to think of what went wrong. I think, um, we, the supporting countries of Afghanistan, should have had more stamina. And we should not have left all the people alone there, the women, also the teachers, and, and I don't know who. Um, they believed in this, and they looked for a brighter future, and now they are left there with the situation. Iraq is another sad example. Yes, Saddam Hussein was a mean dictator, but you cannot base an intervention on false accusations. This is discrediting you in other situations. Um, I'm a diplomat from Germany. You could say a Western diplomat. I have always heard in my life, or often I have heard in discussions, yeah, but you, uh, you went to um, uh, in Iraq, you made this intervention in Iraq, and it was not justified, it was based on lies. I mean, Germany at that time, nobody 
remembers that, but we were also against this intervention. Right? We, we voted against it. We, we had a big, uh, big conflict with the American government at that time. Um, but still, it is attributed to the West, and uh, it is an example of what you uh, uh, should not um, do. It's frustrating for, for us. And um, then it will be abused for Don uh, playing crimes like Russia is now uh, committing in Ukraine. And then um, if you look at Libya, this was at least um, uh, legitimized by the Security Council. But there again, it was ill-planned. It was badly executed. And it was not at all looked after afterwards. So uh, we, we have um, internal, uh, uh, perennial strife there. And the situation is, uh, is very bad. So now we have to ask ourselves, is non-intervention the solution? Should we not intervene at all if we see things like that? But non-intervention also badly failed in a number of cases. Think of Rwanda. Think of Srebrenica. And some of you also might think of Palestine. But this is a very complex um, subject, which will, I not, will not touch, touch here, especially not as a German. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, uh, I know that this is uh, often discussed here. Um, how about Myanmar? We have the five uh, points consensus of the ASEAN countries from Myanmar. Um, and uh, that's very interesting uh, because it's in a fine example for the end of the absolute prevalence of the principle of non-interference uh, within ASEAN. ASEAN countries have seen they had to interfere there, not militarily, but uh, they, uh, with, the, um, uh, uh, with words. It didn't change things, though. Militarily, it was non, a non-intervention up to now. And, and, and uh, so it hasn't changed that. So, um, and what we also do not know is if we had an intervention in all these cases where there was non-intervention, would they have been successful? We don't know. If we had non-intervention in the other cases, in Afghanistan, in, in uh, Iraq, in Libya, what had, would have happened? Huh? It could also have been a very bad situation. Um, so um, we, um, uh, we are in this dilemma as human beings, as states, uh, of what to do. And uh, Talleyrand once nicely described this dilemma, Talleyrand, the, the, uh, the French foreign minister in the early 19th century, um, when he was asked, what is non-intervention? And he said, non-intervention, very difficult term. Approximately, it means as much as intervention. Yes, so so this is uh, this is where we stand. We have um, uh, and, and and you you can ask myself now why did you come if you uh, if you tell us this and leave leave us without any solution any any advice uh, what uh, how how we could improve um, uh, the situation. So I would like at the end of my lecture I would like to uh, present to you now some theses of uh, how our international system could be improved or how how we could um, rectify it. Uh, first and foremost, I would say we need a reform of the uh, United Nations Security Council. The Security Council has failed again and again. The international order established by the UN Charter needs um, to correspond to reality or it will be disregarded. Um, one element which has proven to be totally dysfunctional is the veto power. Um, it should be abolished, in my view. This is my personal view. This is especially true for cases where the holders of the veto powers are involved themselves, no, like, like uh, uh, Russia or Ukraine again. Um, also, um, the Security Council does not reflect the reality uh, of 2023. It's reflecting the realities of uh, 1945. Uh, if we had a Security Council reflecting the power balance of today, um, and if majorities decided, I think this could have a palpable disciplining effect on powers now thinking they can get away with anything. So uh, let's, let's uh, have that as uh, my first point. My second point is um, for, uh, uh, for humanitarian interventions, um, we need prevention and aftercare. And um, there was an international commission on intervention and state sovereignty which the um, uh, General Assembly had installed. 
and they drafted the R2P resolution. It was not accepted by the General Assembly. They changed a lot, but um, the um, uh, the um, this commission has given some advice of uh, what should be um, done in the case of an intervention. And um, they said, it's not only the responsibility to react, react as protect. It's not um, um, only the responsibility to react, but there's also a responsibility to prevent. And that is to say, to fight the root causes of conflicts and thus avoid human rights violations in the first place. So if you see that a situation can come up somewhere in a conflict where it comes to massive human rights violations, then you have to take preventive measures. So this, this is one thing. And the other thing was that also after uh, an intervention, you have a responsibility to rebuild disarmament, very important. Now let's think of thinking of Libya. You cannot go in there and 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 take off one one bad guy and then then uh, you leave all the others uh, fighting. So you need to disarm and you need to reconcile, and of course you need to rebuild the, to reconstruct the infrastructure so that people can start a normal life again. So um, my opinion is interventions should not be ruled out in general, but they should be better deliberated, better prepared better implemented and better aftercared. The third point which I would like to make to this distinguished audience is um, that we all should control our reflexes. And I mean by this, no what about tisms. What about tisms are quite common in discussions. I hope we will not have them here. <laughs> if we discuss Ukraine, we should not deviate to asking what about Iraq? then Ukraine is our uh, uh, subject. If we discuss pa Palestine, we should not deviate to asking, what about Xinjiang? We sh should be willing to face up with each individual conflict, asking what is right in this case and what is wrong, and not come, go to deviate to other subjects. And we should ask ourselves, what is international law demanding us to engage for? And then, we should find the courage to act accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, uh, Dr. Peter, uh, for this very um, informative uh, lecture, uh, which includes many aspects from uh, international law to uh, history to um speaking about the uh, reality of the role of law uh, in our uh, time and the challenges that we are facing uh, i think uh, when uh, dr peter was speaking i thought uh, he is uh, a scholar uh, and academician more than uh, a diplomat so i think that's something good to uh, really um, come back as far as the uh, the cases that he uh, mentioned, uh, these are uh, the views of uh, His Excellency, uh, whatever uh, cases mentioned. Uh, for us here, uh, we are uh, an intellectual and academic uh, institution. We uh, look at things from more uh, academic uh, perspective and try to uh, see uh, how we really uh, look more for uh, positive solutions that can bring people together. Uh, I think there are many uh, ideas that His Excellency uh, mentioned uh, regarding the topic uh, today. And we uh, have uh, already several questions uh, uh, in, the, in the Zoom here. And also I think our professors and doctors will be uh, intervening here. I received also other questions. Maybe we can take uh, some time, Your Excellency, to uh, have some debate and discussion uh, sure. on the matter. Uh, one of the uh, questions that we received here from uh, Dr. Abdul Wahid, uh, Abdul Wahid Jalal, I think he is uh, our doctor in political science. He is in the Zoom. I'm not sure whether he wants to speak directly or I can read uh, his question here. Uh, he is asking, Your Excellency, I extend my gratitude. I am keen to hear your insights on how the global community might forge a path towards a more balanced 
coexistence of these uh, ostensibly contradictory ideologies, thereby ensuring a global order that is equitable and resilient for all. Any comment, Your Excellency, on this uh, question? Yeah, well, you will have noticed uh, during my uh, lecture that I'm an ardent champion of international law. Uh, I think that uh, we all have the responsibility to ask us um, uh, what does the law say, and uh, we, we need to apply it. Um, however, uh, we also need to see whether the application of law um, has a chance uh, to be implemented um, in reality. And uh, if we have um, a dysfunctional element like the Security Council, uh, can we can we base implementation of the law uh, onto this institution? Uh, I think we cannot. Then we we need to we need to find um, a way um, to um, a, a, another way to to implement the law. And um, uh, the problem, however, is that of course the Security Council is also established by law. How can you uh, how can you ignore that? Um, so we are in a dilemma there, and and um, then then we have to ask ourselves what is what is actually the the intention of the United Nations Charter. The intention is to bring about peace. That is the first and foremost uh, intention of the um, uh, of the uh, um, Charter of the United Nations. Um, and if uh, one institution which this Charter has foreseen for implementing peace um, fails. Uh, then others have to jump in. So uh, these others are um, this, uh, uh, the states, the state community. And uh, I think that uh, we all have to work in uh, our uh, different countries for um, an acceptance of law within our countries and make uh, our countries um, stick to the law. And um, the more countries will stand up for the law, the more um, it will also be um, accepted in the world, because uh, then um, forces which um, which try to abuse uh, the situation, uh, they will be contained. So this is my yes. Answer. Thank you, Your Excellency, uh, Professor Khaliq, our professor. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Excellency. Actually, uh, I think there are more questions than what you have answered. In fact, <laughs> so but is a very wonderful piece of deliberation. Uh, I, briefly, I can say one thing, that the situation has almost gone back to square one, that what have been the reason for abandoning the League of Nations to start the United Nations. So it has gone square one again. And when the United Nations was in the process to be established, it's all because the world was suffering due to the Second World War, and thanks to your country. So, <laughs> so uh, perhaps a time has come that Germany should come again and has a dominant role to make a new world order. So the uh, situation was that. And then when the United Nations established, it was uh, supposed to be in New York, and then United States refused to sign because they say these people will decide in New York and Washington will be obliged to implement because the place of, I mean, Washington is the White House. They say, no, we will not agree with this United Nations first place unless and until when the Security Council instituted and United States got the veto power, then they signed the charter. Okay, and the intention from the very beginning has been not to establish a rule of law, might is right. So what did they do? Even if you commit a wrong, they're the one who are the one who do not want to sign the International Court of Justice. They are applying exemption because they say our people will be prosecuted. And that's the fear, United States, Israel, and I think one more state, if Britain, if I'm mistaken, three countries are the one who do not want to sign this International Court of Justice. So this all indicates <laughs> from the very beginning that intention is wrong. Now the question is might is right. Of course, at this moment of time, this might is shifting into East rather than for the United States due to the other reasons. Economic powerhouse, et cetera, is going to the 
artificial intelligence and the rare earth and all those things. So again, the might will prove right. So United States, day today, I think day before yesterday, Brazil has decided that we don't want to trade in US dollars. And BRICS, sorry, Brazil. The BRICS mm. has come to the resolution that we don't want to trade in the US dollar because the US dollar hegemony has created the new world order that need to be balance of course the rest are the details that you have given the idea so i think <laughs> there are more questions than the answers <laughs> thank you uh, yeah uh, i um i thank you for your uh, comment and i think you um, really have uh, touched a hot potato there it's <laughs> it's uh, uh, quite difficult to uh, contradict you um, uh, well, uh, Germany was one of the driving forces of the international statute of the uh, uh, International Court of Justice, so, uh, so we are very, very much favoring it, and uh, we would also like our American friends to, um, uh, to, to join us there, but I know it is, uh, it is difficult, but I think that uh, we also have to, um, and it is very difficult, that that was also what you mentioned, of course, uh, I, I also know that the, the real difficulty is how, how can you uh, make a veto power give up the veto? Uh, that, is, uh, that is the decisive uh, question there, and, and it's, it, it's an uphill uh, battle. Maybe they find other ways that a veto can only uh, uh, it can be overcome by a two-third majority, but you can think of uh, ways uh, uh, to get there. But um, uh, actually, we we have not. Uh, we we must not forget that in all our countries. Uh, we also have a public opinion, we have a public discourse, uh, we are discussing these things. Also in the United States, uh, uh, there are intelligent people who are discussing it and asking, what are we doing here? Shouldn't we also um, uh, regard ourselves as one of equals and abide by international law and have the courage to, um, uh, to subscribe to these principles? Um, uh, the same is true for China. The same is true, of course, for Russia. Uh, all powers who have not uh, signed uh, or who don't want to give up their veto power and who have not uh, come, um, who not want to submit themselves to uh, the International uh, Court, uh, Court of Justice. So, so it's um, uh, this. This is an ongoing uh, debate, but um, uh, I think that at least we must we we must um, clarify where we stand. And uh, uh, what what our opinion is um, from this chair, I cannot change the world, but I can I can tell you what I think what needs to be done uh, if we want to uh, progress. And and this is what I've done. Yeah, thank you, Your Excellency. Prof. Morad, go ahead. Uh, you have raised uh, some very significant uh, themes and issues uh, historically, uh, theoretically, and geopolitically. I want to raise a few. Uh, concerns. Uh, one, you, you have gone back, this is historical, <clears throat> you have gone back to the origins of the nation state. Uh, there was violent treaty of 1648. Uh, that seems to be the most efficient instrument in governance and government uh, in, in terms of the world system. It was a fact and it becomes a, it has become a, a, a system, a global system. Uh, uh, Kisunio has emphasized this uh, this this uh, this uh, notion of uh, the Westphalian origins of the global system. Uh, but this this uh, global system, the Westphalian Treaty, uh, which ended the Thirty Years' War, uh, has uh, subsequently uh, stretched that war, that right to war to other parts of the world, one of which is Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia uh, in the 6th, 17th, 18th century, 19th century, became a theater for the European powers. Uh, Britain, France, uh, uh, Spain, uh, especially I uh, also uh, Netherlands, it becomes a theater of war. Uh, and and uh, the the uh, uh, allocation of colonies and the division of uh, uh, territories was a result of this uh, enmity, uh, war or the avoidance of war. So we are we are uh, recipients 
the 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 uh, geopolitics of outside of Europe are the recipients of uh, the war, which was extended, which becomes a uh, uh, part of colonialism, and uh, this has created many problems where nations are not equal to states. The criteria for nation states, if you have uh, uh, identified, uh, do not apply or cannot be applied uh, perfectly in countries outside of Europe. Europe has quite a perfect uh, division of territoriality and, and, and political divisions, although there are you know, uh, some nations in the, in, in the state of Europe. But uh, in, in other states in Asia, there are many nations in one state. And you also have created uh, nations without states. The Kurds, for example, I mean, you have uh, a Kurds here. Mm. Uh, also, uh, this has uh, created enmity and incompatibility, incompatibility in terms of uh, the worldviews of Russia and China. Russia and China has, not by their choice, become part of that system. But uh, in terms of ideology, they were not part of that nation state system. They, they, they do not practice that, that idea of a nation state. Uh, and China and Russia has big uh, pronouncements. And that's why you find uh, Russia, you know, uh, invading Western Europe, perhaps Russia may not have any idea of uh, 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 territories or borders. And also Russia uh, dominating even now, uh, Central Asia, the, the Muslim states of Central Asia, also China, uh, creating a, a retrospective history to fit into uh, or to retrofit into the socialist communist system. Xinjiang is an example. Also close to Malaysia is Thailand. Uh, that part of Southern Thailand, uh, if Malaysia were to intervene, in whatever form, because what's happening there, up there, is what we call uh, Southern Thailand, which is actually North Malaya, is genocide and ethnocide. So it would be right for Malaysia to intervene. I know there were, you know, this uh, vibes and uh, some, some covert uh, actions over the last few decades. But uh, no, your response on this. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think you enlarged our topic a bit um, uh, because you uh, you refer to nation states and other states which uh, do not correspond to this idea of nation states. Um, uh, I, with the Westphalian system, I just refer to the principle of territoriality, uh, which uh, in, 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 um, which was was followed the principle of um, uh, of personality. Uh, territoriality that that means you have a territory. Um, uh, you have uh, people who live in that territory, can be nation, can also be others, uh, and you have an authority which is exercising the effective power over this uh, territory and over these people living on this territory. And um, I think this this principle is true for all states in the world now. It is a, a, a system prevailing. Uh, it is true for nation states. It, it is uh, true for uh, multinational states. Um, uh, and um, yes, and you, you also touched upon uh, colonialism, um, and I think very correctly you said that uh, one of the problems which we are facing is that these um, uh, these um, the, these borders which have been um, drawn arbitrarily by colonial powers go through nations, have divided nations, and have uh, then uh, and again um, uh, caused a lot of problems. Um, so, so uh, I, I can uh, can agree with all that. But I think that uh, we now we have the uh, the task as the one who inherited it. I, I was born in 1959, so um, uh, I I was not asked before uh, to choose: Do I want to become American or Russian or German? I was just there in this uh, situation. So. Um, uh, we we are all put into this uh, situation, um, and we have to deal with it now. We have to ask ourselves, what what do we do with it? And I think that one, um, uh, and and this is uh, also a European experience, but I, I think it is not um, not a bad one. Um, um, is uh, that um, that we should um, uh, uh, should try to put 
piece on the first uh, level and say uh, it, it, it's no use now to go and try to change borders again according to uh, to national ideas um, we have done that in europe for many centuries and um, uh, it, it was it brought only unhappiness to people my father went to war my grandfather went to war i'm the first generation which did not go to war and i'm, I'm happy for it um, and um, uh, my father, we, we had problems with France. Uh, uh, there were some territories uh, uh, which we always fought about. And, and my father, he told me, actually, that is ours. Huh? We lost it in the war, but it's ours. And and then um, <laughs> and then uh, after uh, professional life, he moved into a region um, which was bordering this area in, in France. And then he he told me, they can have it. It's no problem. Uh, we have the European Union now. I can go there freely whenever I want to go there. I can go there, and 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 uh, they have nice food and whatever. Uh, so um, uh, so it's not a problem anymore. Um, and I think that uh, we have to solve these problems now by by other ways. And one one way is uh, opening borders so that we do not feel them anymore. That's what we we try to do in in Europe. Um, and the other way is to grant. Um, rights to minorities. Minorities need to have the right to um, speak their language, have their schools, and, and, um, and, and dwell in their own way. Then they can accept to be a minority. We have some minorities. We have a Danish minority in Germany. They are Danish schools. They speak Danish. German people like that now. They say, oh, okay, let's learn also Danish yeah, to, to communicate with them. And on the other side of the border, uh, of Denmark, uh, there are Germans living, and they have their German schools, and and so this is uh, how, how we try to uh, to solve this problem. And and uh, I, I think if you uh, if you look at, at your problem with Thailand, uh, the, the the answer is um, make borders invisible, grant people the right to speak their own language and to follow up their own culture. These are Muslim people there, Thais are Buddhist. So that they 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 have uh, their minority rights, and then um, the the problem will not uh, be felt anymore. And uh, I I know that with um, uh, Kurd people, it's a, it, that's that's a really tough problem. Also because your land is divided uh, among other uh, uh, states, which um, which do not grant you um, minority rights, and I, I think that's very tough. Um, but um, in the long run, um, it, it will not so much depend on whether you have an own Kurdish state, but it will depend on that you have rights as, uh, as human beings and as a people to, to speak your language, to follow up your, your own customs um, and, and, and your religion. That, that's uh, actually, I think, uh, the future. If we start with changing borders again, that's that's um, will will not bring happiness to people. Yes, very correct. Thailand Malaysia border has brought uh, the two. We try. People have been crisscrossing the country, especially I mean the criminals. When the Thai government chase them, they rush to Malaysia. Then they are protected here. When they do the crime in Malaysia, Malaysia chase them. They go to Thailand. So there is a problem with that loose border as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, okay. yeah. but then that's a cooperation of police cooperation. <laughs> <laughs> I think if, if police cooperates and is on both sides of the border, <laughs> I want to be a criminal. <laughs> I think with regard to the uh, the practice of international law, uh, questions of morality and force came about. I think Europe has managed it well because Europe has uh, you, you have the EU, which is a super state, and. Uh, and this is one way to overcome the, you know, the, the lack of uh, force of uh, international law. It's also, also the dimension of moral situation, which the European countries have done quite well. But other countries do not see this. We, we, still, we, we still are the, uh, in the archaic state of the, the nation state system. Mm. We have not overcome that. You have. Okay. Okay. I think that's uh, that's good. Uh, for our brothers and sisters uh, on the Zoom, if there is anyone wants to ask directly, uh, please welcome. I have one question here, Your Excellency. It says uh, you have uh, 
uh, clearly mentioned and uh, justified the need for the reform of the Security Council, uh, because as you explained rightly, it created all these imbalances and maybe led to uh, uh, what's happening now. So uh, according to your excellency, uh, what is the best way or approach to start this uh, reform? Uh, process because according to the question there are many also calling for it many countries whether in the islamic world even in the west so how to uh, really go about it in a in a very complex challenging world mm. yeah uh, well um ever since i am a diplomat uh, i had to uh, effectuate um, uh, the marshes um, on on this issue and, and and to convince other people that we need this reform and um, uh, i think we we need uh, and we have to uh, continue working on it uh, and uh, i can say that my impression is an, an increasing number of states um, acknowledges the need for a reform of the united nations system um, and uh, it, the united nations system is all we have we we have no no um, no other solution than than this so we we have to work with it uh, and uh, i think that it is a uh, it is our task to convince other uh, uh, more states uh, to engage here and um uh, germany for instance is um bringing up regularly also with a few um a few other countries we are in, in one boat with india brazil and japan there uh, that we um that we changed the um uh, and the charter of the uh, united nations and change also the um uh, the, the the composition of the uh, united nations security council so um, i think that uh, we need the support of more states for this we need to convince other states to engage in this debate and to sub support our position yes and um, uh, eventually i think uh, it also so depends, of course, um, on on the number of states. Um, if there is um, an ever-growing pressure, then even the veto powers need to consider this, uh, because otherwise they will have the whole world against them, and and that's uh, that cannot be in their interest. So um, let's not lose uh, lose hope. Let's uh, let's try to work on it. Yeah, thank you, Your Excellency. I think I have one uh, brother here. Inga Wasim Bashir wants to say something. Are you uh, there on the Zoom or you say uh, want to know opinion on one point? Do you want to say something? Okay, uh, please make your uh, question uh, uh, short and uh, straight, inshallah. Go ahead. Okay. Only for us. Am I audible? Hello? Yeah. Uh, can you go ahead? Yes. I want to ask you that uh, the uh, human rights is only for white people. And my second point is, uh, do what do you see? That invasion of Russia to Ukraine, is it a protection measure or, or it was a, uh, it's aggression behavior? Because it is invoked by NATO and US. When you, if you will deploy your arms on the border of someone, so how you can expect that someone will not uh, react on this point? Okay, uh, thank you, brother. Maybe uh, I add. I'm not sure whether you since you heard the question. I, no, not uh, okay. Uh, based on his question, there is also another uh, comment here. Uh, uh, he says, uh, is human right uh, only uh, workable for the white men? For the... Hmm. So, uh, but the question here says uh, much more, I think, uh, deeper in terms of putting it in the context. Uh, do you think, Your Excellency, that the uh, supremacy of the European a Western model uh, of civilization and the model of democracy model, they they become like defining the terms and defining the the things. Do you think this is one of the problems or the uh, root cause of what's happening in the world uh, today? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Your yeah. Excellency. 
uh, first, uh, first of all, I would like to state that I think uh, human rights belongs uh, to everyone who has a human face, uh, in, in, regardless of uh, the color of this face or the shape or uh, so the sex or whatever. It's uh, yeah, human rights is what it says, human rights. It's not European or white uh, uh, right. And um, uh, if you um, uh, if you look at Germany, for instance, um, uh, we we have um, right on asylum, which is open to everybody, and uh, we have taken in, for instance, more than eight hundred thousand Syrians. Uh, we have many Africans. We have Afghan refugees. Uh, we we try to live up. up the, it, it is sometimes difficult because we also have people who are opposing it, but uh, still the majority of um, people is upholding uh, this uh, system and. Uh, uh, we we will not uh, uh, go back on that. That's uh, that's very clear. Um, yes. Then um, the the European system, uh, if, if it has to prevail in in um, in the world, um, I'm aware of the fact that uh, uh, European countries have brought a lot uh, of um, pain and sorrow over the world with colonialism. That that's very clear. Also, my country has uh, participated at that. Um, and um, uh, but I can only say I have I'm, I'm born after this time. It is not my time. If I read, for instance, what my grandfather has written, his political uh, ideas, uh, I cannot subscribe to that. That it was another time, and it, it, it was not good. What what happened in 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 uh, in centuries before? Um, and uh, I think that, um, or I would like to ask nations from outside Europe uh, to look at Europe also not uh, at, in, in a historic way, but also uh, what uh, what we are doing now, what what are we uh, championing uh, now? And um, human rights is a good uh, example. Uh, we we would like to um, uh, also to um, uh, support and uh, uh, to foster human rights uh, elsewhere, uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, I think that we we have um, many issues uh, which we did and we cannot uh, cover here in in this uh, lecture. But we we have problems in the world like um, the climate crisis. Um, uh, we have uh, the uh, the pollution of the world, plastic and oceans, and I don't know what. And um, uh, uh, Europe is uh, also offering um, solutions and support for these uh, uh, problems. Uh, and my um, my wish would be that uh, we cooperate and concentrate more on these uh, problems common to uh, to uh, the whole uh, mankind. Uh, then it that we have to deal with wars uh, we, we should have overcome war this is it's a with the ukrainian war it's a step back with other uh, wars what what happens in myanmar and yemen it's a, it's, a, it's a step back we need to concentrate on on other issues and there uh, i think uh, europeans this to say the european union and also germany um they reach out um, they reach out and say where is your where do you stand where can we support you um, and how can we solve these problems which are common to all of us together thank you prop uh, thank you excellency i think we will add uh, two questions and then we will end our uh, lecture today uh, can i have our brother go ahead uh, thank you professor for uh, giving this uh, lecture actually uh, uh, I just want to know about uh, the current, the BRICS issue. I feel like they are coming towards like against Western uh, hegemony, I mean the US dollar issues. So, I mean, how do you see when I see, I mean, as a student, uh, when I see a rule of law by United Nations, what happens is that is not solving the issue actually. It's, uh, it's been over 50 years, and we see the issue of Palestine is not being re resolved. Also, the other issues also. And if we look at the Germany, the Treaty of uh, Versailles in 1999, so we see the what by the name of peace and peace treaty, they import 100, uh, 132 billion gold marks on uh, upon the Germany. So this kind of peace treaty, what happens is that they are doing some sort of injustice 
if we look at the crime and punishment of Dostoevsky, what happened is that you can blame the protagonist that uh, the person killed the Jews person. However, when it comes to like talking about the Hitler issues, uh, we see the injustice by the name of peace of treaty. They have been done by maybe the US allies, other things. And United Nations also, we see the similar results. You talk about the veto power. The veto power also, what happens is that, uh, okay, you can talk whatever you wish, but the apple is mine. That means they are not uh, changing their views or whatever. So in uh, you mentioned about the Iraq issues, you were against the Iraq uh, like uh, uh, war, but still they did not listen. So these kind of things are happening. So BRICS, I think the new movement, I would say, though it's related to the money, I mean, dollar issues against, but do you think uh, UN will be effective in future or it will be just gone? Because at the end of the day, we see that in the by the name, of, like you were talking for hours and hours, we spent 50 years, but the issue is still not resolved in the Palestine. So thank you okay, so much. I think your question should be, is UN going to be effective uh, in fixing these things uh, in the long or short run, or you think, what is your take on this? Uh, well, uh, I would say it is work in progress. It depends on us. It be, depends on all the states, how they engage and what way they engage. Uh, it is um, it's more a marathon than a sprint, uh, what we are in there with the United Nations. Um, uh, but I would also like to say that the United Nations does not only consist of the uh, Security Council, which, which unfortunately is dysfunctional, uh, but there is a UN family. And the UN family comprises many institutions uh, which dwell uh, with issues um, from uh, human rights over uh, environment, um, uh, population, uh, culture, nature, uh, you name it. It's, uh, it's a very widespread organization. And I think a lot of good work is being done there. And we have to acknowledge that. That's, uh, that's uh, positive. I, I do not, would not want to have a world without the United Nations, I must, uh, I must say. So um, uh, but, um, uh, our, our topic today was now how peace can be preserved in, um, in the world. And unfortunately, we have to say it is not preserved. And, and uh, the, um, the institution in charge is, um, is, uh, is the Security Council. And then we, we must say, yeah, we have to, uh, we have to change something. And uh, we may have to make it more effective. But all in all, I would say it's work in progress. Yeah, thank you, Your Excellency. The last question will be from our friend there. But before we give him, I would like to read something from the uh, Zoom here. Uh, when our brother from Nigeria, I think, Alayu uh, Al Haji, he is saying, MashaAllah. MashaAllah means, <laughs> may God, uh, maybe I think he's excited with your uh, lecture here. He says, This is a highly enlightening discourse. I wish to see United States of Africa. <laughs> In a sense, to make the African countries borders invisible and foster more peace and development in the region. Thank you, Your Excellency. Go ahead, thank brother, you. straight to the point. Uh, 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 thank you so much. Uh, my name is Adam Musa. I'm from Uganda. Uh, and I'm a PhD student here. Uh, mm -hmm. Your Excellency, I would like to bring to your attention, uh, obviously, I have to take you back home in sub-Saharan situation currently is not so good. There are plenty of wars. When you go to Sudan, uh, our brothers are suffering. Uh, when you go to West Africa, there are, several, there are several coups which have been taking place and the latest one is from Niger. Uh, I'm afraid the waves of coups in Africa, it's as if it's just starting. So what is German? And the and the United and the European nation and the uh, EU, what can you do really to intervene? You have some power, you have some influence. People are dying. Mm -hmm. So, what can you do? How can you advise? Thank Go you. ahead, Your Excellency. Yeah, um, it is a very justified question, I must say. Yeah, I served uh, twice in Africa, in uh, Congo and in Uganda. 
And um, uh, I, I must say, Africa is very dear to me. And wonderful uh, people, great nature, but also gigantic problems. And uh, I, uh, I mean, I, uh, I, I worked uh, on, on these uh, problems, so um, I have to uh, acknowledge them. Um, uh, there, uh, I think what uh, we do is already a lot. Um, if I can speak for my, my own country, um, uh, especially uh, for um, Congo, um, uh, but there are of course other problems in, in, in uh, South Sudan bordering uh, Uganda. Uh, now we have Niger, uh, the, the problems in the Sahel zone and so on. Um, so uh, we, um, uh, I think that we um, do regard Africa. It's our neighbor from Europe, seen uh, from Europe, uh, as uh, very important. And we um, we tr also try to um, uh, to support Africa not only by um, development aid, but also by um, by economic um, uh, connections. And uh, I think there are also, also some um, some positive signs uh, which you can see. Africa um, uh, has a lot uh, to offer if it comes to energy, to clean energy, and uh, in Europe now, energy is a very big topic. Uh, clean energy, um, and um, uh, Africa has a, a great future when it comes to solar power. Um, uh, when also when it comes to um, hydrogen. Uh, I know that there are German projects there with African states in these uh, fields. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so I think uh, that um, uh, Africa is not neglected. But um, I must also say I always hesitate to talk about Africa. Um, because Africa, it, it seems like it is a country. It is not a country. It is a continent. It is the second largest continent in the world. And it is very, very diverse. African countries uh, are very, very much different among themselves. And that gets blurred if you if you always uh, uh, say, uh, about, what about Africa? You have to look into, into um, uh, the, the uh, different countries. Uh, like um, if, you, if I think of my time in Uganda, um, uh, Uganda had a steady um, rise in um, the standard of living um, uh, from when uh, Museveni took up uh, power up to a certain point, and now it's degrading again. This is worrying me. Why is that so? What needs to be done? What changes do you need in, in Uganda? Uh, if, I, if I think of uh, Congo, Congo has a gigantic potential. It is uh, the second largest country in Africa. There you also can uh, say what, what individually do you in, uh, need to do. Very different from what you have to do in the Zahel zone or in Kenya. So uh, I think um, uh, uh, we, we need uh, specific um, answers uh, to these uh, questions, but be sure that, um, uh, that also this is work in progress and we are aware of uh, the need uh, to do something. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Your Excellency, uh, for uh, your very informative, uh, excellent lecture today from a very uh, well-versed and experienced diplomat and also uh, with uh, academic background. Uh, I was very happy to uh, invite you here and we are all happy of the uh, ideas and the views and the questions and the answers that you brought in. I think as Professor Khaliq mentioned, many questions uh, are raised and they demand answers from great scholars, great academicians, great philosophers. I think what we learned from His Excellency today is that uh, it is a collective responsibility, not only of the diplomats or academicians or um, industry or the whole world need to address these very global issues because they become affecting lives of millions of people in the world. The decisions that are taken in these big institutions, you see their results and how they influence all of us. His Excellency also mentioned very important things when it comes to the reform of the, uh, the uh, Security Council, when it comes to the, uh, the idea of uh, human rights, rule of law, and might. 
This is a very big formula, brothers and sisters, which influences the whole world and which is putting all of us uh, in a very uh, important and great responsibility. I think one of the things that are missing in this formula of uh, rule of law and might, I think what is missing is the concept of values, morality, ethics in our politics. So that's when he concluded that we need to go more for, he was talking about the world family, the United Nation family. This is a value. This is a concept. When we talk about um, ethics and values and global environmental issues caused by our own decisions, by our own economic power or our own international system. I think uh, uh, His Excellency has shown to us that there are many things to be undertaken. Number two, what I want to stress here at the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization is that we are a platform for intellectual and academic discussions and deliberations and we need to go more global in our mindset, in our thinking, in our thoughts, so that we address the real issues of the world, not that the things that we see in the books, but in the real world, brothers and sisters. And as we invited His Excellency, Dr. Peter, the ambassador of Germany, we will also invite the ambassador of Russia, the ambassador of Ukraine, and other people to come and put their arguments, their views, their perspectives. And what is needed is how to create that common space, common ground of people moving forward in saving the world, not saving themselves or their ideologies or their countries or their nations. The world with all these global issues of environment, global warming, global things, wars, death, economic crisis, uh, COVID-19, and the, now they are talking about the next one already. So the formula needs to include that idea of togetherness, of collectiveness, of inclusiveness, of ethics plus power plus rule of law. I think with this thinking, we can really create great spaces for human engagement, brothers and sisters. And I think His Excellency has really put a lot of good ideas towards that idea of global peace, global um, sharing of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, challenges, brothers and sisters. With this, we really uh, thank His Excellency for the great uh, lecture. I thank you all, uh, those who are here and those who are on the, in the Zoom and also in the YouTube channel. Uh, our scholars from different countries are listening to us. May God uh, bless you all for coming and attending this ISTAC World Professorial number 24, delivered by our guest of honor today, uh, Dr. Peter. And uh, we thank you all for the effort. We will be giving uh, our uh, certificate uh, of uh, delivering the lecture to His Excellency and also a token of appreciation. Uh, and then we end our uh, 24th IWPL. Uh, brothers and sisters, may God bless you all. Salam alaikum. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Your Excellency, you want to just to give you our. What next Yeah, these are some of our publications, your excellency. Uh,